what time I am afraid, I will trust in thee. There are times in our lives that we are tempted to be afraid. Life circumstances, health circumstances, all kind of things, political circumstances, but we can always trust in the God of the universe. And he happens to be my God, and I hope he's your God as well. And I tell you, I am glad to have a God that is trustworthy. I've had children, and uh, in the past, there are times they get afraid, even to the point where they'll come and knock on my bedroom door while I'm sleeping at night. I do not like to be woken. Not if I've been asleep for five minutes or for 555 minutes. And uh, I have had children that will come and they'll be, because they're afraid of a dream or something like that, pound down the door and wake me from an otherwise wonderful, solid sleep. It just takes a little hug and, okay, go back to bed now. <clears throat> they run back to bed and everything's solved. I'm glad that our Heavenly Father does not react when we run to Him afraid like I react my kids run to me afraid in the middle of the night. I'm like, get out of here. I'm out of, you know, movement right here. God is always there. And I'm glad He's our God and we can not be afraid because we can trust in Him. I'm thankful for good God. Turn your Bibles, if you would, to John chapter number 2. John chapter number 2, as we finish up, Lord willing, tonight our series on alcohol and the Christian. And hopefully, in the broader sense, why we do as Christians what we do, why we believe what we believe. And maybe there's some things in your life that you've done for a while. Maybe uh, you don't drink alcohol, but you don't know why you don't. Besides the obvious logical fact that it is detrimental on so many logical le levels, all right, I can bring you hundreds and thousands upon thousands and even millions of homes been destroyed by alcohol. I don't know of any homes that have put, been put back together again, okay, because of alcohol. Like, look at this, the glory of God, look at this home, this father and this mother, these children, they're all back together because they started drinking together. I, I don't know of any. I don't, but I can on this side give you house after house after house through the riddance of that and victory of that back together again. I can show you accident after accident because of alcohol. I can't show you anybody who said, listen, I am the best driver the more I drink. Don't have that. I can show you people who make very, very bad decisions without alcohol and even worse decisions with alcohol. I don't know of anybody, and maybe there's someone in the world, but I don't know of anybody, who while once they begin to ver get very intoxicated, very drink, then now they just become a guru on everything. They do in their own mind. Uh, just besides the, the logical sense, we're looking at the Bible to say, what does the Bible say about this particular topic? And we've spent a number of weeks on it. I appreciate your patience. And many of you have commented that it's been a help to you. I hope it has been. Uh, even if you're strong in this, all right, or where you stand, hopefully it strengthened your belief. All right, we ought to do things because of God's word. All right, that's a good foundation. We ought to be able to give an answer to every man who asks you. And if someone asks you, hey, you're a Christian, I work with you, and you don't cuss, and, 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 you, don't, and you don't drink, why don't you drink? Hopefully you have an answer for them, rather than just, well, I heard it at church. No, that's okay. I mean, you can do it that way, but hopefully because the Bible says this, this, and this. And we had a couple questions that I want to just deal with briefly tonight before we get into our, our last little section here on alcohol in the Bible. One question that came in was this, is NyQuil a sin? No, no, no. And, and uh, I will not, uh, any of these questions I, I deal with, I'm not trying to be humorous or anything. I'm glad for the questions and would, would welcome them all. In uh, senior Bible class, we'll have a question and answer day uh, sometimes. And I have told the seniors and juniors at times for years that when you ask those questions, this is a judgment-free zone, kind of like Planet Fitness. You can ask what you want to ask without fear of retribution for those questions, all right? Every once in a while over the past 15 years, every once in a while you have someone that's trying to be a little bit, a little bit snarky, a little bit, uh, they want to uh, tangle verbally, and uh, sometimes it's a teenager. Those people, we usually can remind them that I'm older than they are and smarter than they are, but, uh, but questions, this is fine, is NyQuil a sin? I would point you to Proverbs 31, verse 6, where the Bible says, Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish. Shown to be used, strong drink, in a medicinal, a medicinal manner. Now, some people will refuse that even under those circumstances. If you remember, and I'll talk about it again tonight, my major pre premise and principle is that alcohol is not to be used as a beverage for a Christian. So if you're drinking NyQuil because you're thirsty, 
I would suggest finding something else. Medicinal. But there are a number of medications out there that, when abused, have very bad side effects, correct? But under the right scenario can be helpful. Morphine would be one of one such treatment, would it not? Can it be abused? No doubt. Can it, for a medicinal purpose, be an assistance to that? Well, yes. Now, some people will say, well, I don't want to use any of that at all, and I have no problem with that. No problem. Some people, well, there's some painkillers out there uh, that are very heavy painkillers, right? Very heavy. I, I tend personally, this is a personal thing, I tend to avoid those. All right? I tend to avoid those. Uh, some of them have very, some very addictive qualities to them. I tend to avoid them. I am not telling you the Bible says you have to avoid all of them. I'm telling you that I avoid them. All right? And, I, and if you choose to avoid them, fine. I, I do think there's some risk involved in some of those things. But to say it's a sin, I do think we see that there is an exception there for medicinal purposes. And two other questions here, kind of along the same line. Is there any context in the Bible where wine is grape juice? I think we showed that. And then what's the Greek word for grape juice since there's a distinction? And the Greek word there is oinos. All right, and that word in not only the Bible, but in ancient writings, all right? I did some study in ancient writings, uh, not just a biblical scholar, but a, uh, men who were scholars during that particular time period. What is the etymology? What was the, how was that particular word used in their culture, all right? And studied some of their writings. And the word also during that time would stand for jelly and for jam, for grape juice, for an alcoholic fermented wine, for reconstituted grape juice, or for anything that happened to be from the vine. All right, in that culture, in that time period, that word oinos that we have in our New Testament, the Greek word, was used all over the place. It was a very common word for anything from the vine. The last question that I want to deal with tonight was, did Jesus turn water into wine? Or what did he turn into? And that is the subject of tonight's lesson. So that worked perfectly. A nice little lead and see that. So turn your Bibles, if you're not there, to John and the second chapter. We have in John this, the time that Jesus turned water into wine. And this particular miracle has been, I believe, much abused in the context of what, uh, how the Bible, I believe, portrays it. And hopefully tonight I'll give you some ideas and some principles that I, why I believe that what Jesus turned this water into was not an alcoholic beverage. All right, I'm going to give you some principles tonight based on that. That's where I'm going with this. I read an article, like I told you early on, I read different articles. I read an article from a, a pastor. He was a lead pastor. Now, some churches, they have to designate who's the lead pastor and who's not the lead pastor, right? This was the lead pastor. I don't know what he led, but he's a lead pastor. I read an article about about wine, read it uh, yesterday, and get ready for this particular session, this last one. And he says this, uh, he says, wine needs to hire a new PR agency to help with its image in evangelical churches. They would consider us to be an evangelical church, all right? So he said that wine needs a new marketing guy because it gets a bad rap inside of churches like ours. He's right. <laughs> He's right. So far, he and I agree, except that they don't need to hire a new marketing guy. It is often ignored or rejected by many American Christians. I don't have time or interest to unpack why it is that wine fell on hard times among many Bible-believing churches. But I am interested, he says, he writes, in helping to paint a more biblical, faithful picture of wine with the hope that I can encourage my brothers and sisters to understand wine as a gift, an image used in Scripture to teach truth about God, and an element of our Christian faith and practice. So he says, I want to help you expand the view of wine because it's a gift. And it is an element of Christian faith and practice. He goes on to say this, and this is what really got me. There's a few things that'll get me. This was one of them. Let me read you the last paragraph that he writes. Wine is the gift of God. That didn't get me yet. All right, all right, we, we, can, we, can, we can argue about that, but in it, we see, in it, in wine, 
He said, in wine, we see the love of God in providing life and joy for all people. Now, I'm not there yet, but I'm getting real close when I read that. If he'd stopped there, I just would have said, well, he and I majorly and, 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 and completely disagree. But he continues, and this is where he got me. But we also see a deeper meaning. In wine, we see the love of God. In the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which removes our guilt, satisfies God's wrath, and saves all who believe. Now let me just translate what he just said with that phrase. He said that wine of all things illustrates and is a picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, that's what he says. In wine, we see the love of God in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, which removes our guilt, satisfies God's wrath, and saves all who believe. So he believes and wants us to believe that wine, as a gift from God, is the very picture of the gospel. I have a problem with that. I have a problem with that. A big, semi-truck, mat truck size problem to this lead pastor. Wine is not the picture of salvation, in case you're wondering what I think about that. Wine is not just the love of God that provides life and joy for all people. Hello. <laughs> Hello. So, it's around us. Tonight, with the Lord's help, we'll look at this last little section. Let's look at John chapter 2 in the third day, verse 1. There was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. It was a big event. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto him, They have no wine. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. Now later on, remember that, that these water pots were set there for the purification of the Jews. These were for a specific purpose in Jewish celebration and in Jewish culture. These were not just random water pots just sitting around just because. These were not just pots outside that had no purpose. These pots were for the purifying of the Jews. Each of them contained two or three firkins apiece. Verse 7, Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water, and they fill them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now, and to bear unto the governor of the feast, and they bear it. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water that was made wine, and knew not whence it was. But the servants which drew the water knew, the governor of the feast called the bridegroom. And he saith unto him, Every man at the beginning doth set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. In this beginning of miracles did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory, and his disciples believed on him. Lord, I thank you for this time we have tonight. Lord, I pray for your help, your direction, and for your spirit to touch us, Lord. I pray that these truths would not only make sense to us, Lord, but on a spiritual level would touch our hearts, that we would make decisions, Lord, based upon your word, Lord, not just because of something we hear, but because your spirit bears witness with the truth. Lord, may we live our lives based on how you teach us and reveal yourself and manifest yourself to us. In Jesus' name I ask, amen. Jesus turns water into wine. In this particular discussion about whether Christians ought or are permitted to drink alcohol even in moderation, this particular account is often thrust to the forefront. It must be okay because Jesus turned water into wine. And we know, based on what we read, that it obviously was extremely alcoholic and fermented, and everyone just had a big party. We can see that in John chapter 2. Therefore, therefore, we can social drink, and we can drink over here, but just don't get drunk. 
The question is, did Jesus turn water into alcoholic wine? Now remember, as we look at these things, what, what do we do when we come to a Bible problem? All right, I use problem, of course, in quotation marks in case you missed it. All right, a Bible problem. There are times in Scripture you will read something. You say, wow, that doesn't make sense. That looks to me like a problem. All right, when we hit one of those problems, you get the point? Problems, they're not real problems, they're, they're fake problems. You get the point, all right? Yeah, shake them and rattle them, you get the point. All right, because you're you're, someone's going to come to me and say, well, pastor, I found a pi- problem in the Bible. No, 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 it's a problem, all right? Not a problem, a problem. When we come to a Bible problem, all right, remember a couple things. First of all, remember that Scripture, first of all, is given by inspiration of God. All right, we start from the foundation that the Bible is God's holy word. Because it is God-breathed, all right, it is supernatural in its origin and supernatural in its cohesiveness, it is a supernatural book. It is not just a book that I'm randomly reading as opposed to a news article or as opposed to a tweet or anything else that can be filled with errors. We begin with the idea that an error-free God brought an error-free book, all right, supernatural. We begin with that premise, that presupposition. It's God-breathed versus man's opinion. Number two, remember, if we come to a problem in Scripture, that we want to work from the clear to the unclear. There are times in Scripture that things will be very, very clear. Husbands, love your wives. What does he want me to do? Love your wife. But you're not married to my wife. You're right, I have my own wife. You don't hear what she's like at home. You're right. If you did, then, then what? Husbands, love your wives. Wives, reverence your husbands. See, I just figured I'd step on toes tonight, right? Well, you don't know how dumb my husband is. I have some inkling. If you knew all the poor decisions he made, you wouldn't respect him either. Perhaps. But I don't have to. It doesn't say, friends, reverence your friend. Or another husband, reverence the other husband. All right? Some things, things are very clear. Other times things are not as clear. We want to work from the clear to the unclear. We don't start with the unclear. So that's why I began the last few weeks talking about the clear things that the Bible says about alcohol and wine. Things that you're like, okay, that makes sense. So now we can deal with some unclear things. And remember this, third, this fourth principle. I'm sorry, third principle. That Scripture does not contradict itself. So if it appears to contradict itself... The appearance is in my perception, in my understanding, not in God's Word. Don't forget that verse, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. It is quite possible that your mind or my mind is not as smart and as capable as God's mind. That means just maybe, just maybe, there are some things that will be a mystery, all right, that my mind will not fully comprehend until I'm translated in glory with Him. But along the way, he gave us a rational, logical mind. He is a rational and logical creator. You can see that throughout creation. Creation makes sense. All right? If you look at your body, it makes sense. You have opposable thumbs. All right? What if your thumbs came off your elbows? That wouldn't make sense. Your eyeballs are here. They're not in the bottom of your heels. Right? He was a logical and rational creator. The way the world spins, everything that happens is rational. So remember, we have a rational God who gave us a rational mind to think rationally. But there may be some things that are right out of our reach. But Scripture cannot contradict itself. So we come to John chapter 2 now. We say, what, what happens here with water into wine? Well, there's a couple of possible answers to, these, to this particular situation. The first answer, all right, the one that some would claim, I'm not claiming this, some would claim that Jesus turned H2O, water, from where they drew it, from a well, into alcoholic wine. That's the first possible answer, right? The one that some people claim. That what he made was something that was just intoxicating, that was, according to modern alcohol content, 11 to 13 percent. 
All right, now understand that there were, there were, six, uh, there were six water pots, and they were two to three firkins apiece. Now, you don't know this, but uh, if you happen to look it up, a firkin is about nine gallons, right? Now you know something you didn't know before it came down. A firkin is about nine gallons. Hey, you got a firkin over there? Nope, I don't have, I have a half a firkin, all right? And uh, I have a five-gallon gas can, about half a firkin, but a firkin is about nine gallons. So each of these water pots, two to three firkins apiece, were about 18 to 27 gallons of liquid. 18 to 27 gallons of liquid. Uh, a gallon of water, I believe, weighs around eight pounds. I happen to, I don't have it written in my notes. I remember this because I was told, this, somebody looked at it for me, right? I think it's eight gallons. Or is it eight pounds? I'm, I'm seeing heads shaking yes, all right? I'll tell you how I knew this because remember my water heater died, right? Water heater was a 40 gallon water, uh, uh, 40 gallon water heater. When I was replacing it on Saturday, I'm like, man, this thing is heavy. Then I realized there was about 40 gallons of water in it. It's about 320 pounds, so those of you who can do math. Plus the water heater was about 125 pounds itself. And if you ask, I moved it. Yes, I did move it. All right, all by myself. And uh, so I, I happen to know how much water weighs. These would have weighed at uh, 20 pounds, uh, 20 gallons, about 160 pounds. All right, give or take a few in there. These were not light things. 160 pounds, and uh, men, that can be a little bit of weight for you. 160 pounds to move a water pot that weighs 160 pounds. Maybe there are two. Maybe there are three, three servants apiece. We don't know how many servants, but there are some there. What that means, all that information is for this, that Jesus, when he did this miracle, and this is not up for debate, this is not what he made, this is how much he made, he made between 108 to 162 gallons, 108 to 162 gallons of something. Now, in ounces, it's anywhere from... 13,824 ounces to 20,000 ounces of some type of beverage. Now, this was probably a larger feast, but understand that 150, about midpoint in there, 145, 145 gallons of wine is a whole heap of wine. A whole heap of it. When I did some rough figuring on what they state is about the appropriate amount of wine to serve to your guests at a wedding, yes, I looked it up. You could feed, you could, you could serve between three to 500 people at the end of the feast, what Jesus made. And some would have us to believe that he made alcohol content. Or if you lit it this way, I figured this one out. For 12-ounce glasses of wine, if everyone had 12-ounce glass, he would have served 1,728 people for one 12-ounce glass. So let's imagine for a moment that what Jesus made was alcoholic in content and that we now had 500 people at this wedding. Right? They all had about 36 ounces of this wine. 36. Now, what I'm told, that would be enough to get someone inebriated, is what I'm told. I don't know. So, what you'd have me to believe, what you have me to believe, is that Jesus and his very first miracle ever recorded, his very first miracle ever recorded, had the biggest drunken party bash ever known in Cana of Galilee. No, no, I mean, help me here, right? Because it's at the end of the week, and that what the governor says is, whoa, if, if we're to believe this is what he did, what we're to believe is that what the governor said was, whoa, normally people put good stuff out first, but wow, you've saved the best till the end. This stuff is awesome, loosely translated. That's what he says, right? Whoa, whatever this stuff is, boy, you've crushed it. You've nailed it. You brought the best stuff. This is unbelievable. Wow. 
what an, what an event, what a party you're having right here. That's what you'd have me to believe if that's what Jesus did. Well, some will say along the way, well, no, Jesus didn't really make it 11 to 13 percent. It was really, really, really low alcohol percent in Bible times. Well, let me grab a 2,000-year-old bottle of wine to test it for you. Oh, wait, we don't have any. But let me read my Bible. Hey, I can do that. And in the Old Testament, a little bit before Jesus, when they talked about wine, remember we looked at this? People got drunk. Remember we talked about it in Proverbs? Like a mast on a ship, all right? And their head hurts, and they don't know what they say. They don't know where they're at. Intoxicated. Whatever it was, people could get intoxicated on this wine. So don't tell me that it was really, really low percent, super, super diluted. Even children could drink it because people in the Bible time, all right, were drunk. Noah was drunk, all right? He wasn't just like a little bit drunk. He was a lot bit drunk. A lot with his daughters, a lot bit drunk, a lot bit. So don't tell me, don't try to tell me, well, it's really, really different because I see people getting intoxicated. And so what you'd have me to believe if this were true, intoxicating, alcoholic, fermented wine is that in the character of Christ, the very first miracle that he did, he had the largest party. Now look for me, please, in verse number 11. I think this is key to this particular miracle. This beginning of miracles. Did Jesus in Cana of Galilee and manifested forth his glory. So you're going to tell me that Jesus, when he revealed his glory, the glory of the Son of God, the glory of God the Father, the beginning of miracles manifested himself, the first thing he did was get everybody drunk. And that reveals the nature and the glory of God? Help me here, because that's what they want us to believe. If that's what it is, then that's what Jesus' revelation of himself, and the, the verse goes on that says, and his disciples believed on him. Oh, wow, you've got to follow the guy we follow. He knows how to have a party. That's what you'd have me to believe. His disciples believed on him. Wow, you've got to follow this guy because he's done things we've never even seen. Boy, people were just dropping all over the place. They were passed out on the floor. This is our Savior? It does not jive with my understanding of Jesus Christ. It doesn't. I cannot justify it. I cannot qualify it. I cannot make sense in that scenario. Beyond that, to do that and to provide that much, all right? He'd be going against the teaching of the command in Habakkuk, giving his brother to drink. He would have denigrated himself because the one who is the word, Jesus is the word in John chapter 1, one chapter earlier, is, is the same word who says that this wine biteth like a serpent and stings like an adder. Don't be deceived by it. The same one who said not to be deceived by it, who is the word, then produces it for everybody at this wedding to show himself. Not only was it just any alcoholic wine, it was the best they'd ever tasted. Or, or, Jesus made a juice that was so fine and refined. A juice that was the sweetest, most elegant juice ever known. I don't know which one dies with your scripture. Because if Jesus made water into wine, then let's get the moonshine rolling. Jesus turned water into wine, we better all become craft brewers. Because that's what Jesus did to show his glory. Or maybe Jesus did something else. And so I don't take that water, I'm going to make something wonderful for you. That's not going to cause you to sin. That will not cause you to be addicted to it. That will not be a stumbling block or a snare or violate Scripture, but it will be in perfect harmony with all of Scripture that will showcase His glory, the sweetest thing known to man. doesn't make sense. Let me show you one more passage. Luke chapter 7, verse 34. 
Turn there, if you would, Luke 7, 34. And by the way, those pots for, for purification, if Jesus had made water into wine, would have then denigrated all those Jews. They wouldn't have been pure any longer. It would have changed the purpose. Luke chapter 7, verse 34. One more argument people make, one more quote problem passage. They'll say this, well, Jesus, he drank. It's right here. John chapter 7, verse 34, he did it. And it says, the Son of Man is come eating and drinking, and ye say, behold, a gluttonous man and a wine-bibber, a friend of publicans and the sinners. And they say, look, Jesus, the Son of Man, he drank wine. He is a wine-bibber. Because he was a wine-bibber, we can be a wine-bibber too. Someone who drinks or becomes intoxicated with wine, who is not afraid to be around wine. This one, I think, is a fairly easy one to answer. He was called this by the Pharisees and the lawyers, the accusers of Jesus. If we were to believe that Jesus in this passage was actually what they said he is, we're going to put more stock in the negative accusation of Jesus than the, the, the totality of Scripture's clear teachings. Let me tell you some other things they also accused Jesus of. They said about Jesus that thou art a Samaritan. They called him a Samaritan. Jesus was not a Samaritan. We would not say, well, they called him a Samaritan, so he hasn't been a Samaritan. We would say, no, that doesn't fit with Scripture. They also said that Jesus had a devil, that he was possessed. They said, thou hast a devil. Did Jesus have a devil? Was he possessed? No, he was not. So if we in this passage say, well, obviously he drank, then we'd have to apply the same rule to these other passages, which we would not do. It would be blasphemy to do that. They also said that Jesus was a blasphemer. They said that you have make, you make thyself to be God. That you make yourself to be God. The problem was Jesus is God. He didn't blaspheme. He just told the truth. <laughs> Before Abraham was, I am. They said, oh boy, you've done said it now. Except he said the truth. They also said that Jesus was illegitimate. They said, Jesus, you were born out of, a, out of a bad situation. We know. We know your history. And uh, Mary and Joseph, they, they, you know, they, weren't, they didn't do right before they got married, which is what it would have appeared to everyone else. We know the truth that Joseph and Mary were pure and a virgin, and the Holy Ghost came upon Mary, right? So we're not going to believe him that, that, that he's a Samaritan, that he's possessed, that he's a blasphemer, and he's illegitimate. And they also said... We know this man, speaking of Jesus, is a sinner. <laughs> Let me help you, friend. Jesus is not a sinner. <laughs> it's not. So if we take this passage and some, some will say, well, Jesus, look at that, Jesus, Jesus drank. He obviously got intoxicated. He obviously was a drunk at, at some point, but, you know, you say, no. I can't believe the negative accusations, not here, and not throughout Scripture of Jesus Christ. It's not, not true. So let me kind of wrap up the final takeaways. Last little thoughts, in about two minutes, we'll be done. Remember this, that being controlled by something besides the Holy Spirit is always forbidden. Being controlled by something besides the Holy Spirit is always forbidden. Now, we're dealing with alcohol in the Christian but it can be your phone. It can be chocolate. It can be coffee. And you're like, Pastor, you drink coffee. You're right, I do. And some days I don't. You know why I don't some days? I'll tell you. I want to make sure that I don't get a headache from it. That I'm not controlled by it. Now, if you drink coffee, you don't have to do that. It's what I do. Scripture always forbids me to be controlled by anything other than the Holy Spirit. Call what you want. i got to walk in the Spirit. Second thought is this. If Scripture is comprehensively negative about something, we ought to take note of it. As I worked, we worked through that through Scripture. Overall, through the majority of passages, 
They're either neutral as far as just painting a picture, or they're negative. Or they're negative. There are a number of neutral ones just in a description, or just, but they're overwhelmingly negative in relation to wine. Remember this, that we should never redefine clear passages with passages that are unclear. And that is probably the largest complaint I have about those who would, who would do this. They try to take a couple of unclear passages and redefine those that are very clear. They look at the clear ones and say, okay, well, that doesn't mean that. doesn't matter because of this particularly unclear one. The last thought is this. Even unsaved people acknowledge the dangers of wine. I told you I found an interesting statistic. I'll read it now. The quote is this, in fact, a recent study that included data from more than a thousand alcohol studies and data sources, as well as death and disability records from 195 countries and territories from 1990 to 2016. So a 26-year study of over or more than a thousand different alcohol studies, not a thousand cases, a a thousand alcohol studies from 195 different countries concluded that the optimal number of drinks to consume per day to minimize the overall risk to health is zero. Where'd you find that? Was it Baptist.com? No. Nope. That you can find at www.cancer.gov. Even unsafe people see the danger in it. So why would I as a Christian say, you know what? It's my liberty. And not only is it my liberty, it is the single thing that illustrates the gospel. My friend, I can't, I, I can't side with that. I look at Scripture and I say, listen, the Bible says stay away from it. Lord, thank you for loving us. Thank you for your word. Lord, thank you for the truth from your word. Lord, may our hearts respond to that. In Jesus' name I ask, amen.